All right, uh, welcome back. I hope you had a nice little break. Um, welcome to my presentation on the sub project three in Spark, which is system performance optimization. Um, today, I want to briefly give you an introduction, um, which I think is always important because it's uh, good to put our research into the right context because we're working on so many different uh, fields within AV research. Then as a second, Part, I want to give you something like a mini lecture. Maybe it doesn't really deserve the title lecture, but it's going to summarize the findings from our latest uh, uh, journal publication. And I'm going to present my ongoing and future work to you. Um, I'm not going to focus much on my ongoing work because right now I'm working a lot on the uh, energy management strategies, which Ariel and Triasha have already been talked, talked, talked about. Yeah quite a bit. So I'm going to uh, leave that out today. Um, so as I said, my my PhD is on performance optimization for underwater vehicles. And I think every time we, we mention the word performance, we really have to clarify what we mean, because it's a very, very vague uh, title or a very vague word, performance. And thinking about vehicles, especially underwater vehicles, we could say that performance um, mostly is about maneuverability, navigation, reliability, speed, and endurance. And as you can see by all those little bubbles, uh, depending on how you interpret performance, you could have a lot uh, more points adding to the whole system or the whole concept of performance. And um, I think it's interesting because SMARC actually contributes to basically every aspect of it. We have Sriasha with his hydrobatic uh, maneuvers which definitely contribute to increased uh, system performance by increasing maneuverability. We have um, Nacho, for example, working on SLAM techniques for better navigation. We have, uh, you could probably argue, for example, Urza's behavior trees, which increase system reliability. And then we have, for example, RDLs and my research, which definitely aim at increasing the endurance of underwater vehicles. And uh, endurance is also what is um, my focus and my research. And as you can see, we can tackle the endurance problem from different perspectives. We can have more energy efficient contr control strategies, for example, uh, MPC, like uh, Srihasha has presented. We can think about operational aspects. We can think about hydromechanics and flight mechanics. And what uh, is the most important for me is propulsion systems and energy systems. And today I'm going to focus on presenting my research on propulsion systems. Uh, and as I said, Ariel has already covered some of the energy systems uh, aspects. Um, why it is important that we increase the endurance of AUVs is uh, very simple to answer by just looking at one example. One of the um, key goals that we want to achieve in SMARC is to be able to go into environments which people have not been ac accessed before. For example, under glaciers, the polar and, uh, and uh, yeah, Antarctic and Arctic ice caps, or in very deep sea environments. And the key performance parameters which enable us to do that is uh, range as a very first one, but also autonomy and maneuverability. But range definitely is the most uh, crucial aspect. And also as a nice side effect, by, by, reduce, uh, by increasing the range, we also reduce the uh, require trip time, which makes um, AUV operations and AUV missions much more affordable. So I think that's a very nice uh, side effect. Um, but now let's jump into my little mini lecture on transit performance of AUVs. And uh, AUVs, when I say AUVs, I refer to any kind of autonomous underwater vehicle. Some people, they think gliders are uh, a separate uh, category, but I think it's one category. So. Uh, let's look at this. The last uh, research that we published uh, last summer or autumn was is titled uh, Glider Performance Analysis and Intermediate Fidelity Modeling of Underwater Vehicles. It's a collaborative project from uh, me and from my supervisor, Jacob Kuttenkeuler, and uh, Thomas Melin, who is an external uh, collaborator. He's now affiliated with FOI. Um, maybe some of you know him. He's been working on uh, aeronautical engineering for a long, long time. Um, so, and this little graphical abstract kind of summarizes what we 
uh, attempted to do in this in this research project. We are looking at two different propulsion systems. We have the propeller, which is the most common and conservative uh, means of propulsion, and then we have the buoyancy engine, which is the heart of underwater gliders. And uh, we looked at how these two propulsion systems compare, uh, also including the cases of, of biofouling. We did some modeling uh, and also looked at published and computational and experimental data, and then evaluated how the transit energy efficiency looks like for low levels of biofouling, for high levels of biofouling, and for the two different uh, propulsion systems. So let's uh, look at what this lecture is going to contain. Just briefly look at how transit expenditure can be defined. Look at uh, the glide metric, which we use to compare the transit efficiency of the two different kinds of vehicles. Uh, then look at a case study where we analyzed the legacy gliders, which are a slocum spray and sea glider. Commonly, they are called the legacy gliders in underwater uh, gliding. Uh, we look at some experimental data, the effect of biofouling, and then also at how the modeling and the performance prediction can look like. Um, so the first case is the propeller-driven AUV. And for uh, simplification, we just look at a neutral buoy neutrally buoyant AUV. So the buoyancy is equal to the mass of the vehicle. Um, and then we can express the energy expenditure simply as the drag times the distance covered. And if we want to express it as the energy expenditure per distance traveled, we simply divide by a distance traveled and it is the drag. It's a very, very simple case, considering that we fly horizontally and not uh, at any angles. And if we then consider this very common expression for drag using the drag coefficient, we can express the propulsive power in transit from one point A to one point B uh, as this one, one over two times the density of uh, seawater times the velocity cubic times CD, the drag coefficient and times the reference area. Um, and if we want to compare the transit performance of this propeller driven AUV to that of a glider, we would want to derive a similar expression for the glider. And that's what we have done in, the, in this research project. So we have the glider when we are not moving when we are uh, just floating somewhere in the ocean, we have a neutral buoyancy. So it's the same as the um, the same mass balance basically as in the uh, propeller case. But the glider changes its buoyancy. It makes itself heavy and it makes itself light by by either expanding an internal bladder or by filling water tanks. And then um, the hydrodynamic forces acting on the vehicle make it move forward and down or forward and up. And it glides along this uh, zigzag trajectory from one point to another, covering the horizontal distance S. And if we look at the energy expenditure, if we simplify again a little bit, we assume we don't need to um, consume any energy to initiate the diving, but we need to consume energy when we turn at uh, apogee depth, depth, uh, depth uh, in the bottom, then we need to turn and we expend the energy the net buoyancy that we need to pump um, and the depth that we want to that we have traveled down and want to travel up again and if we then use some very simple math trigonometry and uh, some hydrodynamic uh, characteristic equations for the underwater glider we can express the energy expenditure per horizontal distance traveled as uh, one over two times the net buoyancy times the ratio of drag to lift coefficient um, and that is simply because the uh, tangent of the glide slope, which is shown up here in the, in the sketch, is uh, CD over CL. And what we now want is a similar expression to the one we've seen before, something like one over two times the um, uh, density times the, in this case, the horizontal velocity component cubic times A coefficient times A. And by doing some math, we can show that this coefficient CL, CGL, which is uh, which I call the glide coefficient. Um, it's quite a complicated expression. It's CD times CD squared plus CL squared to the power of three over two divided by uh, two times CL cubic. And I'm not going to derive it now in this uh, presentation, but it really simply comes from, from these two expressions. 
um, if you have ever seen a glide polar, a glide polar shows the vertical and the horizontal um, velocity components of a, a gliding vehicle, could be an area glider, could be a uh, underwater glider, and the two uh, velocity components can be derived from just conservation of mechanical energy, and then you get these two equations for horizontal velocity u and vertical velocity v. And commonly, these are expressed in the glide polar, which show which gliding states the vehicle can uh, can take. You can see with in in the case of underwater gliders, we have different buoyancy levels, and with higher buoyancy, you reach higher velocity levels. You can see the ratio of uh, vertical to horizontal velocity is also the glide path angle, so at which angle the glider glides uh, through the water, through the ocean. And what you cannot see, but which is also contained in here, is the angle of attack. So if we look at basically zero horizontal velocity, we have also uh, zero angle of attack. So it would, in theory, would just be falling straight down um, with nose first, and then moving from, from this point on the curve, I'm gonna use a laser pointer, going from this point of the curve all the way to the center, it's an increasing angle of attack. And uh, you can see that some uh, glide angles can be actually reached in two different states. For example, this one here, and then if we move along this uh, line from the origin and also this state here. And that is always one that is very inefficient and one that is uh, quite efficient. Mm. So, and from here we can derive this uh, CGL coefficient. So if we now look at how the propulsive power for both vehicles compare, basically just uh, by dividing one by the other, we get this expression, which uh, we call the glide metric because it basically shows um, if you know all the hydrodynamic coefficients and potentially the efficiencies, you can easily say uh, for two similar geometries, which means of propulsion would be more efficient uh, at, what, at what velocity also. You could also make some simplifications. You could argue that the drag coefficient CD0, which is for the body without wings, is uh, very close to the one with wings because the wings shouldn't contribute much to the drag. You could also argue that maybe the efficiency of the buoyancy engine is similar to the efficiency of propeller and motor. Uh, so that ratio would be one. And then you can quite easily compare uh, different vehicles by just using the hydrodynamic coefficients. And that is what we've done in the study. We looked at the three um, legacy gliders. Uh, and there is a lot of experimental and computational data available online, published by different authors, by uh, the universities that have been involved in the uh, development of these gliders, and so on and so on. Uh, there we are. So we have data, data, data. We have also data on how biofouling affects lift and drag coefficients. It's uh, been published over the past years, a uh, couple of times. And from, from these data sets, we have, um, in a simple case, we have used penalty factors to penalize the drag coefficient when we have biofouling and the lift coefficient when we have biofouling, just simply by, induce, uh, by increasing the drag and by reducing the lift coefficients. And then we compared the three gliders and how they would perform in, um, in transit. Um, and you can see here in the middle at 0%, we have equal efficiency. Um, and on the left side, the continuous line are the legacy gliders in ideal cases. So basically um, no biofouling and uh, everything works just as uh, it does on the paper. And on the right side, we have the cases of biofouling, which kind of re represent the practical cases because in reality, especially if you consider very, very long missions, it has been shown that even after just one to two months of continuous operation, you can have quite severe amounts of biofouling depending on uh, where you actually operate in which uh, oceans. But you can see if you move from the mean line, from the zero line to the left, we have more efficient gliding and uh, if you move to the right, we have more efficient propeller-based propulsion. And as you can see in the ideal cases, uh, basically all gliders across these- Sorry, Clements, do you hear me? Yeah. 
I see slide 13. Okay, I don't. Do, do, do you now see slide me. 14? I, I'm not sure what the other people see. I see, I see 13, 13 as well. Yes, okay, um, we are stuck in 13, I think. Yeah, um, okay, I'm going to start that again. Mm. Sorry, I've, I was seeing 14, so do you now see 14? No, you don't. Here. Do you see 14? No, I see Clemens Dutch is started st screen sharing. Okay. Ah, well, today is uh, a day of technical problems. Um, I'm going to try that again. Thank you for intervening. Do you see 14? Still nothing. Still nothing. That's so weird. Do you know Maybe see? try a different type of screen sharing, like sharing the screen or sharing a window. Yeah. Do, do you don't see 15 now, right? No, it's dark. Oh, that's so weird. Um, okay, then I'm sharing everything probably. Do you now see 14? No, it's no. very dark. Do you see 12? It's just darkness. It's, it's just dark. darkness. We okay. just see that you're sharing your screen. That's so mm -hmm. weird. I started to, at least. Can you send it to me, Clemens? Is yes. it big or try, try to send it to me and I will try to share it. Um, now, no, stop. Now you see my emails? Yes. Do you, if I move to the right, do you see yes. PowerPoint? Ah, great. If I move here, do you see 14? Yes. Oh, awesome. Good. Good. Then I'm trying to recap. So now you get uh, the, the data to what I've just tried to say. So this is one of the main findings from the research that we've done. We have uh, the 0% line in the middle, which shows uh, basically uh, equally efficient propulsion for propeller and for, for glider. And if we move to the left, we have more efficient gliders. And if we move to the right, we have more efficient propellers. Um, and we looked, as I said, at the three legacy gliders, slow comb spray and sea glider in ideal cases and in biofouling cases. And you can see that biofouling has a very, very uh, severe impact. Um, in ideal cases, the gliders across the across the whole velocity spectrum that we looked at are something like 20 to 25 percent more efficient. But if we have biofouling, the propeller is actually uh, a lot more efficient. Um, for the two torpedo-shaped gliders, which are sp spray and slocum, they are about 50 percent more efficient. And for the sea glider, which has this um, kind of like a pear-shaped uh, body, we have a lot of Reynolds uh, number variation, like uh, um, effects. Uh, but you can see it is definitely more efficient to use a propeller if we have a lot of um, biofouling. Um, and this is a very interesting case, a very interesting finding, because a lot of people have been arguing about which is the better way to propel. and. Uh, I think only very, very few people have thought about that biofouling is a real issue and it um, is important to consider it in, in analysis like this. And this really shows that if you have biofouling, gliding is not very efficient anymore. And there are only two ways out, don't glide or take care of biofouling. Um, another thing that we did in this study was um, presenting a numerical model, which is an intermediate fidelity modeling. We use some analytical expressions. We use some empirical expressions. Uh, we also combine that with the computational data from, from publications. And we ran some uh, example uh, optimizations. In this case, we looked at, I think we looked at the slocum glider and then we did some um, variation of the wingspan. And interestingly, we get a uh, maximum efficiency close to the 100% uh, wingspan, which is the actual wing, 
span that Slocum has today. Um, so I think this shows that the tool is also very, very um, neat. It's accurate enough. We have some variation in um, in the blue box here because, uh, as I've mentioned before, you can reach a lot of um, velocities using different. It's basically different states in the in the uh, glide polar, so to say. Uh, yeah, and I think this is a very interesting model that can be used for op design optimization, for um, also for teaching and uh, understanding how how gliding works and how different changes in configuration affect the gliding performance and so on and so on. And I think this is where I conclude this little mini lecture. Here's some references if you want to know more about uh, some specific aspects of it if you want to know some if you want to have some uh, data or references just send me an email and then i will reply to you and now very briefly about uh, today and tomorrow what i'm working on uh, these days right now as uh, we've already heard a couple of times we're working on um, energy management strategies for before underwater vehicles using experimental data from field trials uh, for power consumption, basically. And uh, we're also working on implementing gliding capabilities in our AUV Lolo, which we are, uh, I think, hopefully, um, demonstrating in Christina Bay in uh, the beginning of June. So those of you who come to see us will quite certainly also see some, some gliding. Uh, and that also means in the future research, I will do some uh, experimental st studies on underwater gliding. Uh, this will be quite explorative because there are some uncertainties when it comes to how efficient is the buoyancy system that we are using in Lolo. So how the research will look like exactly is to be seen. It will be known after Christina Bay for sure, when we have done uh, the first gliding trials. Uh, we're also working on implementing a fuel cell slash battery hybrid system in, uh, in Lolo. Uh, I think in the in the, the like the current status is that we essentially have agreed how to finance it but we are sorting out some of the legal aspects and then hopefully starting in the autumn and in the future maybe next year i would also like to work more on the effects of environmental disturbances on glider performance because biofouling is not the only disturbance we could also consider for example the currents and uh, uh, halo clients and so on as uh, environmental disturbances. Yes, and that concludes my presentation. Um, thank you very much. And as I said, if you have any questions, then please just drop me an email and I will make sure that you will get the answers you want. <laughs>